Today, I would like to guide you into understanding the structures of both the Old Testament and the first part of Genesis from chapter 1 to 11. In this class, I would like to share with you the story of the three pillars of Genesis, followed by a few frames of various topics from chapters 1 to 11. Then, in the next class, I will help you to understand the leaders' stories from Abraham to Joseph. You will discover that it is not simply a biography, but God's providence for His covenant. Genesis allows us to trace back God's work with His people and their origins from the beginning to Egypt. There are three groups representing Genesis. Of course, there are many more aspects to understanding Genesis, but I would like to take only three major aspects. These aspects are Genesis, Contrast, and Covenant. It can be safely said that Genesis is full of beginnings besides the Lord, who of course had already existed before the creation of earth, as stated in chapter 1. Here, I will only be talking about the seven beginnings for your producer. The first is the creation of the heavens and the earth in chapter 1, then the origin of sin in chapter 2, and the beginning of people after the flood in chapter 6, the birth of various languages in chapter 11, Abraham's righteous behavior of faith in chapter 22, and finally, the history of Titus and the birth of Israel as a nation. When you read the Bible, you can discover that God talks to us in a very interesting manner. He always brings us something we can compare in topics for the sake of our easier understanding. Here I am going to take seven major samples from Genesis. Have any of you heard of the city of Enoch in chapter 4, verse 17? You may have heard of the Enoch who ascended into heaven with the Lord, but even though they have the same name, they are two different people. The city of Enoch is a contrast to Eden, because it was built by Cain, the father of Enoch. Cain built the city and named it after his son Enoch. This was a trial against the Lord. He intended to protect himself and his family without God's help, even though Eden was built by God for men. The city had to be full of sin, because God was not there. Finally, the Lord destroyed it using the flood. The last one is about Joseph and his brothers. In the beginning of the story, Joseph was chosen by God, but in the end, Judah was chosen as David and Jesus' ancestor. So the contrast converted to Judah and Joseph. Why? I'd like to say that it was because of Joseph's marriage to an Egyptian woman, who was the daughter of a priest of an Egyptian idol. We can't know for sure whether she became one of God's people after the marriage or not. On the contrary, Judah was chosen by the Lord, even though he was married to a foreign woman from Canaan. Why? Because he was restored through his daughter-in-law, Tamar. There are many covenants given by the Lord in the Old Testament. One of the more well-known covenants is the one given to Abraham, promising that he will be made into a great nation, be blessed, and his name made great as sin in chapter 12, verse 2. We also have to consider the fact that there already had been a covenant supporting this in chapter 
1 verse 28 be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground there was also another covenant of deliverance for adam in chapter 3 verse 21 in a different aspect garments made of skin for adam and eve to protect their body instead of the inappropriate fig leaves this also is a kind of covenant given by the lord he also gave a covenant to ishmael who was unchosen by him in chapter 16 verse 10 i will be getting into detail about these leaders next class looking at the stories of above from genesis as a human it is quite hard to believe them how about you of course hopefully all of you believe in these stories which genre do you think the book of genesis is is it a myth a legend simply a story or any other I'd like to think Genesis as a fact, the fact of God's work with the people. This is a background of a Genesis that we have. Who is the author? Yes, Moses, who was qualified to write it as the leader of Israel and God's messenger. If you look closely at Genesis, it almost seems like it had some Egyptian influence and had something very similar to the accounts of the creation of Babylon in Numa Elish, such as chaos, light, sun and moon, and man. But Moses is clearly giving us a refutation defense of the mythos to show that the Lord is the true creator of the heavens and the earth. Now we will go through them one by one. In order to support our belief, we must first appreciate the Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, or we won't be able to move forward. Hence the reason why I selected this as the key verse of Genesis. Here we need to learn that God in Hebrew, Elohim, means three gods. This reaches us the existence of one God. There are two ways to interpret the word creating, the initial act of creation or a summary statement of the entire chapter. Let's first have a look at your headings of chapters 1 to 11. I found some very interesting and unique headings. How are they? It may help you understand better. Have a look at the major topics of chapters 1 to 11. The first story is about the creation in chapter 1, followed by Eden's layout in chapter 2. Then the fall of man in chapter 3, and the story of Cain and Abel in chapter 4. The story of the flood comes next in chapters 7 and 8, followed by the covenant in chapter 9. The story of the Babel Tower in chapter 11, then the genealogies of Adam and Noah in chapters 5 and 10, respectively. Then chapter 6 talks about the sins committed by the people, which was the main cause of the flood. This is the skeleton of the first part of Genesis from chapter 1 to 11. Of course, the genealogies of Cain and Shem are also present in chapters 4 and 11 respectively. Now, carefully look at the order of topics from the creation to the Tower of Babel. As you can see in the lower area from the flood to the Tower of Babel. There is a pattern. 
What does the flood mean? It defines the destruction of every living being on earth except the ones in the ark. The Lord intended to recreate his world with the survivors in the ark. It was the new creation in reference to chapter 1. As for the covenant, God prepared new conditions for man to live in. Hence the new Eden, as described in chapter 2, while the Tower of Babel is the new fall of man as seen in chapter 3. In this context, chapters 7 to 11 is a repeated cycle of chapters 1 to 3. Do not try to memorize these seven topics, just digest it and logically understand them. The Lord created everything in six days, and He described the duty of man in chapter 1, five duties of BIFSR in chapter 1, verse 28, be fruitful, increase your number, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over all living things of the sea, the air, and the ground. This is a duty as well as a covenant. This is the origin of many covenants which were given to Abraham and his descendants. Let's talk about Eden. Where is Eden? There are many theories on the location, but it is not important. The more important thing is the spiritual meaning of it. What does Eden spiritually bring to us? First, notice that Eden was constructed by the Lord for man. He created rivers, animals, and vegetation, basically designed it just for man. Then finally, a suitable helper was created, Eve. It was perfect for the man to live in peace and in comfort. Everything was ready for him, the perfect environment. If we had lived in faith, we could have enjoyed such a living today. But once you commit a sin, your life is in trouble. Chapter 2 also describes how God created life from dust. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 Please remember the term living being. Who are we? We are living beings with the breath of God. This God's breath in Hebrew is Ruach. This word is used in three ways in the Old Testament. The first one is the God's breath we just saw. The second is in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering on the waters. The Spirit is Ruach. The third one is in chapter 8 verse 1, the wind. The waters from the earth receded by the wind, like this, Ruach, has three meanings, Spirit of God, God's breath, God's breath, and God's wind. Now it is easier to understand why we say the wind of the Holy Spirit. This is Ruach, which is breathed into us to become a living being. We were given life along with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you an interesting story of a woman. God created a woman for Adam. Notice that her name even means a suitable helper. Why did God call her a suitable helper? Because this was her main responsibility given by God, helping her husband. Here some girls might not agree with this, but you should not get depressed and feel sexuality discriminated. 
This is not the time for it. It has a deeper meaning to it. Help? Who needs help? People who are not perfect or have trouble in their lives need help. Perfect people do not need help from others. This basically means that men or husbands are not perfect. They are with a fault. It is difficult for a man to live alone and it is for this reason a man will leave his parents and be united with his wife and they will become one flesh. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 24. This is not about sexual discrimination. It is about a complementary partnership. In other words, a man and woman are complementary to each other. From a spiritual perspective, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a test from the Lord. The man and woman could not pass it, so sin came into our lives. The fruit appealed to Eve in three ways, good for food, pleasing to eyes, desire of gaining wisdom. In chapter 3, verse 6, the five results of the sin were crawl and eat dust of the serpent, enmity between woman and serpent, child-bearing the pain of the woman, the ground is cursed, painful toil on the ground of the man. However, the Lord delivered them with the garment of skin, replacing their inappropriate coverings of fig leaf. Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel outside Eden. As the chapter begins, Cain becomes a sinner because of his wronged offering to the Lord, but he did not stop there. He continued even further by murdering his brother, Abel, with a jealousy. God interrogated him, but he refused to acknowledge his guilt. Here, if we look at the meaning of Abel's name, it is very interesting. It means empty. Cain was banished to a foreign land in consequence to his sins, just as Adam and Eve had been banished from Eden. But chapter 4 closes with the story of Seth, who was in place of Abel and his son Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 26. When men began to increase in number on the earth, man's wickedness became great in God's sight, and man became flesh. In chapter 6, verse 3, whose days would be a hundred and twenty years? There are two ways to interpret the 120 years. The first is considering it as his life expectancy. The second is the years before the flood. However, the more important thing here is that man became flesh. What was man in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7? He was a living being, but now he is a flesh. Finally, God destroyed what he had created with the flood. Noah's family and the animals in the ark were the only one who survived. This was the beginning of the new Eden, but even this trial was not successful because of the sins of man. The last part of chapter 11 is about the genealogy of Shem and continues to the genealogy of Abraham. It is an epilogue and a bridge to connect to the story of Abraham in the following chapters. This is the configuration of chapters 1 to 11 of Genesis. To briefly summarize, the seven major stories describe to us 
the origin of Israelites and their history from creation to Abraham. In other words, God's dealings with His people from creation to His chosen person Abraham. This is the first part of Genesis.